Hey, what up guys? Got a lot of requests to talk about live gaming, so what the hell? Let's just get it all out on the table and talk about good old-fashioned service-based gaming and what it's doing to our industry. The cost of making a video game has dramatically gone up in the last, I would say, 10 to 20 years, and every year, that cost goes up exponentially. From the early 1990s to today, we've seen the average cost of game making rise from about one to two million dollars to over 100 million dollars. And it's not rare to see the biggest games run up budgets of over 200 to 250 million dollars. That's a quarter of a billion dollars. Quite literally, games require more bytes and digital data processing today than they did in the past. The salary for voice acting, Programming, art, sound, and directing, pretty much anything related to making a game, has skyrocketed. But in lieu of that, the box video game is still $60, despite the fact that 20 years ago that money is actually valued at over $100. And what I'm describing is of course inflation, meaning that if you bought the same game 20 years ago, right now it should be charging $100. But games don't sell for $100, nor do they even sell for $60 anymore. The newly released video game is pressured to keep the cost low via the alarmingly high rate of sales, especially on Steam. So it's not uncommon to see a game release for $50 or even $40, or potentially have a $60 price tag but then drop them down within a few months via the sale. You can see how this could create a problem for recouping the cost of making it, especially when games actually should be charging more than $60. But there's a secondary problem. There's no guarantee that a game will actually sell. With so many games to choose from, gamers no longer have to buy the next big best game. They want the best game. They want it right now, the one with the most players, the best graphics, and the best gameplay. B-rated games that can't deliver on that checklist simply get left in the dust. You might be like, hey TL, that's not true, given how indie and mobile games can be a lot more popular than a AAA game. Yes, a cheap game can do this, but statistically speaking on the whole, most cheap indie games released on Steam never sell more than a handful of copies. Furthermore, the average mobile game makes somewhere in the range of a dollar per day if they make money in the first place. And according to Steam Spy, the average Steam game only sells 32,000 copies, and that's including the biggest titles that do sell millions, of course skewing that number dramatically. So what kind of psychopath actually makes a video game knowing that it's a shot in the dark if his or her game will actually make even a single dollar? This mentality easily explains the shift in how modern video games are created. With the rising cost of game developments and the uncertainty in revenue, this industry has turned to the mass consolidation and mass acquisition of video game studios. As costs have gone up, and developments no longer feasible for many publishers, they've gone out of business over extending their ideas, resulting in zeroing out bottom lines on the balance sheet. The video game development graveyard is growing every day and these companies have been mopped up by big publishers like EA all the time. AAA publishers have turned to acquiring those small companies that have been knocked out or those that are just desperately clinging on for dear life. And as that was happening, cheaper means of making games popped out of nowhere in tandem with changes in consumer technology and lifestyle. Flappy Bird showed the industry that you can make a billion dollars by spending next to nothing, just having one single good idea that's addicting to the mobile gaming industry. Or making a fortune without needing a 500 person development team or a $250 million budget. Games have proved this all the time on mobile and free to play services. So if you think about it, that mentality is what's changed everything today. There's simply no need to throw all your chips into the pots knowing that you're not sure if you're actually gonna be winning it. You'd be better off shielding yourself against that risk by inverting the investment equation, which leads us to where we are today, live gaming. Live gaming was designed to help reduce the unstable and volatile environments of game development in the modern era, basically what I just explained. Extension-based gaming combined with free-to-play or lower box prices helps curb risk and increase customer lock-in. Cheaper games force game makers to stay within small budgets too, which is good for managing risk. And they also help mitigate sticker shock and allow players to enter the game without the sensitivity of dumping $60 up front, and that's a big, big investment for some people. Think about it, if a game can charge a lower upfront cost and spread player incremental income, 
evenly in the months following a game release with post-release content, DLC, and microtransactions and all that stuff, they will get more customers and potentially more money out of each of them. Here's a scenario behind this revolution of video game pricing. Consider the following scenario. Every person on Earth looks at a game and determines how much they're willing to spend for it. We each have our own value equation and we won't purchase anything if we feel it's not properly valued, aka it's not worth the money. So here's the scenario. Player A is willing to spend $30 on our game and player B is willing to spend 60. Anyone willing to pay $60 for our game will also pay $30, but we also know that anyone willing to pay $30 will not pay $60. So why not charge $30 and fill the game with an in-game monetization model that will get both players to buy in initially? If they do, both players buy our game for $30, netting us, the game maker, $60. The same revenue had we charge $60 and just had player one buy it. Now we have two wallets on the table for live gaming services instead of one with the same amount of revenue earned, increasing the amount of potential income for our company into the future. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Assume player C comes into the equation who has a maximum price sensitivity of $125, meaning he's willing to pay $125 for our game. If we charge $60 for our game, we lose out on $65 of money that that individual was willing to pay in addition to. Assuming that $60 for our game is standard and does not include any live gaming services, we left quite a bit of money on the table with player C. It is better to lower the base price to $30 and monetize the inside of it so that player C will A, buy the game, and B, shell out up to his willing price of $125 on upsell content that we can provide via monetization in an in-game store. With this strategy, we have locked in all three players and maximized our revenue with each. We have not locked out anyone from participating and giving us money for our game. So let's put this on paper to see if we really do make more money with live gaming. Our two options were to release the game at $60 or release it for 30 bucks and take on some sort of monetization model. If we go 60 bucks, this guy isn't gonna buy it. This guy buys it for 60 and this guy buys it for $60 too. So we've made 120 bucks. But we've also lost a customer and we have no way to make post-launch revenue without investing into the developments of new DLC, which will cost us greatly. If we go 30 bucks in live, this guy buys it for 30, this guy buys it for 30, and spends $30 on additional in-game stuff. This guy buys it for 30 as well, and spends an additional 95 on in-game stuff as well because, well, he thinks that the game is worth that much money and he was already prepared to spend 125 bucks. So what's our grand total? We've made 215 bucks, nearly doubling our revenue in just three small customers. If our game sells 500,000 copies, we will make an additional 16 million dollars in this example. And on top of that, we also have the potential for more players because our game is just flat out cheaper, as well as no need to spend time developing official DLC because we've already got that live marketplace set up to give us money post-release. So are you still wondering why this entire industry has gone extensions, free to play, and live gaming? Sounds like a better deal than simply praying people buy your game at full price, right? The beauty of the live gaming model is that companies can extract the full amount of payment from each and every player up to their willingness of purchase. Players can choose what they buy and in what capacity, which will line up with how much they're willing to spend overall. Once those limits have been reached, companies then can do what they've always done, lower the base game price to capture additional marginal sales. So it's in this system, by doing this and having more than one point of sale, each player will spin up to their own price sensitivity, creating an absolutely brilliant system that no one even really thinks about. This is why live gaming systems work so well. So in my eyes, there's no way video game prices will increase in the foreseeable future. This tiny example is what the underbelly of the live gaming model actually looks like, and it's quite eye-opening. This has been Tone Loke for Downward Thrust. Much love and thanks for watching, guys. Let me know what you think down below and have a great day. We'll see you guys in our next video.